Welcome to the Get Sellers Calling You podcast for Christian real estate agents, where we help you grow your real estate business with some great marketing tips and grow your faith with some powerful radical faith teaching. I'm Beatty Carmichael, and I'm glad you joined us today. Today, we're going to be doing another Radical Faith Bible Study session, and it's going to be absolutely phenomenal. You'll really enjoy it. So sit back and watch it and listen and be very blessed. Okay, so we are going to do a uh, almost an ad hoc. This will end up being a Q&A, possibly, depending on how long the first ad hoc starts and lasts. And then we'll start back with another series that we're going to do starting next time. But real quickly for, um, uh, for the podcast listeners, don't forget to subscribe and don't forget to share, uh, please. And then I also want to uh, introduce a new book that's just coming out. It's called The Prayer of Freedom. And if you remember a series we did a while back called Infirmity and the Will of God. And we started talking about what causes sickness and infirmity. And is it God who sends sickness upon us because he wants to teach us something? Is it fate because we're in a fallen world and things just happen naturally? Or is it something that we do? And what prompted that whole series was in last several years, just before we started, I started teaching on that, We've had a number of friends who uh, either them or their loved ones, very sick, ended up dying. Three of these folks were pastors, and they all came to the conclusion, it must have been God's will, that God probably sent the sickness that took their loved ones away. Because the Bible says, if you pray according to God's will, he, know, he will hear you and he will do that for which you prayed. They prayed that she would be healed, and the person isn't healed. So therefore, it must be God's will. The problem with that is it's a little too simplistic interpretation because you start to dig deeper, you realize there's a lot more to it than simply that. And what we started to do in that series on infirmity and the will of God, we started to look in Scripture and see what are the patterns and what does it actually talk about. And we can rule out that God sent it because we're under a new covenant. That new covenant makes us one with Christ, Jesus, the Son of God. And Jesus is the mediator between God and man. And therefore, God can't send anything to man without it going through Jesus. And he can't send his son sickness and infirmity. Not only that, but with the blood covenant that we have with Jesus, uh, the definition of the blood covenant in simple terms is all mine is yours and all yours is mine. So if Jesus is in perfect health, we claim his perfect health. So we have to rule out that God sent it. It, it doesn't fit the new covenant. It could fit the old covenant, but not the new covenant. Then we looked at um, fate. Is it because of the fall that we have all kinds of sickness and disease? And we found no biblical evidence. We can say, absolutely, God did not send it. And we can say the Bible is silent on whether it's part of fate because fate is simply natural cause and effect. And the Bible doesn't teach natural truths. It only teaches spiritual truths. So we can see experientially that we can get diseases naturally. I'm healthy. You're sick with the flu. I'm good around you. And now I got the flu. That's a natural cause and effect. But the number one thing we started to see with over, we went through six specific examples in the Old Testament, six specific examples in the New Testament, and then modern day stuff. And that is very specific references between sin and infirmity. That God says to the, to the Israelites after they came out of Egypt, if you sin against me, I'll send all of the diseases and infirmities and disasters that I sent to Egypt upon you. We even see in the New Testament, Paul saying that those who are taking communion uh, without assessing the body of Christ, 
and they're doing it in sin. He says, that's why some of you are weak, some are sick, and some have already died. This is where James 5 says, confess and repent of your sins and you will be healed. And what we see is this direct correlation between sin and infirmity. Going through that series, I put together, at that time I called it the Freedom Guide, Do-It-Yourself Freedom Guide. It turned into the Freedom Prayer, and it's now turned into a book called The Prayer of Freedom. And it's a very simple book. It's about a 90-minute read. And for my audio listeners, you can just simply go to theprayeroffreedom.com. It'll take you directly to the order uh, line. Right now, it's over on the Amazon page where it links you to. But it's just a simple book. And the 90-minute read at an average reader is explaining the understanding biblically with what sin does and how what I call spirits of discipline that God sends. He doesn't sin. He allows spirits of discipline to enter our lives to bring discipline to us for one purpose, which is to repent. Because in a real simplistic sense, sin does two things. Number one, it breaks the relationship with God, relationship with God. And the other thing sin does is it breaks our image of God. And when we repent of our sins and believe in Jesus, it restores our relationship with God. But we have to repent individually of our sins to restore the image of God. Because the image of God is without sin. And the definition of us being without sin in a very simplistic state, the righteous man is without sin because his sin has been repented of. We only receive the atonement of our sins through faith. We only receive the breaking of the image, the restoring of the image of God through faith. That faith is obedience. And the great command that Jesus gave us is repent, for the kingdom of heaven is in your midst. So this book, The Prayer of Freedom, walks you through that in a very simplistic understanding. Then the second part of the book, I call it section one and section two. Section two of the book is the prayer. And it is a very thorough understanding. It's, a, it's where you can make a list of the things that the Lord prompts you on in various categories to identify those things that are the cause of discipline in your life. A lot of times we don't even recognize discipline. I, like um, I remember, and, and it comes in different forms. One of my friends who's, uh, yeah, James is on, uh, on the Zoom right now. He emailed me and said, my sister is, is very sick. Can, I, can you send me money? She needs to go to a specialist. So what's going on? And he, he, uh, uh, she'd been poisoned. Another woman in her village had been poisoned and died. Someone's going around and poisoning people. And, uh, and if I understand the story correct, is about the time that my friend James reached out to me, his sister was bedridden, unable to eat, very weak, uh, stomach aches, headaches, just, you know, just going down. And, and the Lord directed me to send him prayer number two out of this book because of the situation that was going on. So the, the prayer of freedom is actually three prayers. <clears throat> prayer number two is a, a very specific purpose for what I call agreement sins, where it's not something that we do, an activity sin, it's something that has been agreed to, that is contrary to God. So I sent that to James and said, pray this three times a day for three days. Have your mom and sister do it too. And then email me back and if she's not well, I'll send you the money. So he emails me back and says, basically, she's fine. She's out of bed. She's eating. All the headaches gone. Stomach's gone. Um, all she needs now is just a little bit of supplement to get the rest of the poison out of the kidneys. But I mean, it was a total turnaround. What that was, was something tied to a spirit. And the prayer of freedom gets rid of it. It is the most impactful thing. A while back, I did a teaching series, some of y'all were here, on uh, spiritual warfare. And I had made a comment shortly after teaching it that that would be probably the most impactful teaching I'll ever do, simply because it goes to the root of most people's issues, whether it's relationship issues, 
whether it's stress and anxiety or depression, whether it's bipolar disorder, whether it's um, fibromyalgia, addictions, the common root is there's something there giving spirits the right to attack us. That something is always unrepented sin. The key to get free is simply to identify what's the sin that let them in. And the problem is it's not quite so simple. There are three things going on. You have uh, activity sin that you repent of, something you do, and so you repent of having done that. You have an agreement sin that you have to renounce. An agreement sin is something that you agree to that's contrary to God. It's usually an iniquity. I'm not going to go into all that. It's all in the book. But then anytime sin is present between two people, whether it's an activity sin or agreement sin, there is a spiritual connection called an unholy soul tie that could also be at, 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 um, at the root cause. So knowing what's going on and how to break it, renounce it, repent of it is the key and knowing which ones. And the Lord over a period of time led me through putting this together. And it is very thorough, very systematic. Anyone can do it on their own. And I, before I wrote the book or as I was writing it, I wanted to do a test. I wanted to calibrate how effective is this prayer. So I teach at a women's addiction recovery center here in town. And I teach three classes on Wednesdays. So I had my students make a list of all of the issues that they are experiencing in their life and then rate them on a scale of zero to 10 where they are right now, okay? And then I had them go through the prayer of freedom by themselves. They made their own list. They went through the prayers all by themselves. And then at the end of the period of time, it's a 30-day program, basically, I had them go back through their original list and re-rate everything of where they were right now. So these are things you can imagine. If someone's been suffering with addiction for years, there's a lot of commonalities. They're probably heavy, weight, not overweight, but there's a heaviness in their life, just feeling weighted down with all kinds of torment, probably darkness in their life, a lot of um, unforgiveness. A lot of a trauma and abuse from early childhood, that's almost characteristics of all of them. You have addiction urges, you have bipolar disorders, you have all kinds of uh, constant aches and pains that they just live with. And nearly nine out of 10 who completed this, um, uh, the prayer of freedom, nearly nine out of 10 saw a 100% cessation going from whatever number they rated down to zero in almost every single thing they listed and anything that was still remaining, which is only a few things, but only for a few people, they, the intensity had dropped down to about one third on average. That's powerful when you can take a person struggling with addiction for years and simply have them make a list with God's help of things that they've done that they need to repent of and then pray through a very structured set of prayers. You don't have to know what to pray. You just pray it. The words are already there because it's a legal document. It's a, you know, we talked on this back with spiritual warfare that the issue we're in is a legal battle. We see God on his throne. Throne is the ruling center of a legal environment. We see that God is in Mount Zion Mount Zion is the heavenly counterpart of Jerusalem. It's the capital of God's entire creation. We see uh, uh, principalities, rulers, and dominions. All of these are talking about legal structure. And so what, what these prayers are is they are legal prayers in the spirit realm. And as we pray them, they have legal implication. And that legal implication is severing all of their rights to these unholy spirits that are attacking you and me. And when those rights are severed and we say you have to leave and we ask, Lord, please take all of these spirits out of my life. It goes just like that. Let me just read. I'll just read the first one. I mean, I'm not going to read. It. I'll just tell it. 
So I have a friend, I call her Pam in this, or maybe it's Penny, I forget. But um, uh, with her, she had been, um, she was an addict, uh, alcoholic. She was um, uh, living on antibiotics. She's in a period of 20 years, she'd had strep throat seven times, bronchial infections, precancerous cells. She um, uh, went through all kinds of just horrible junk in her life. She was um, uh, diagnosed with fibromyalgia and uh, depression and no cure. And she went through this process of the prayer of freedom, simply repenting of sins from her life. And that same day, it's all gone. That was 20 years ago. And none of it's ever come back. I mean, this is powerful stuff. Things that we deal with all the time, we say it's just natural. So I'd just like to encourage for those who are listening to this, if you're struggling with stuff or you have loved ones who are, theprayeroffreedom.com. Get the book. It's really, really simple. And it's really powerful. So didn't mean for such a long-winded promotion, but I'm passionate. And when you get it, make sure you read it all the way through to do the end, chapter 14, because chapter 14 is the real reason I wrote it. And we can change nations with it. So with that, um, as I mentioned, we're going to be a little ad hoc tonight on this teaching. We're going to do some Q&A, but before I get to the Q&A, the Lord wanted me to talk on going through trials and going through tests. I call them trials of sin and tests of faith. But I want to, I don't have anything specifically prepared on this other than life experience. And I want to just kind of talk through this a little bit because a lot of times we go through a lot of stuff and it's either what I'll call a test of faith or it is a trial of sin. And I've talked on this on one of our previous sessions, so some of y'all may recognize these. The idea between the two is when we are living a life of unrepented sin, then most of what we go through are trials of sin because these are trials of spirits of discipline that are involved in our lives, bringing torment into our lives because we've invited them in. We do things God says not, and then we don't obey Him when He says repent. Because a precursor of repentance is the heart to stop doing it. And so often we do things because we want to do it. We know it's wrong, but we choose to do it because at the moment we say, I want to do it. So screw you, Lord, I'm going to go do this. That's not exactly what we say, but that's the intent of the heart, right? And what happens is it opens up a door for spirits of discipline. And those spirits of discipline start to come in and bring yeah. havoc to our life. So these are trials of sin. And trials of sin is because that sin is unrepentant. The other type of issues we go through are tests of faith. And tests of faith are things that the Lord purposely allows us to go through, not because we've done something wrong, but because he's polishing us. If you remember, we talked at one time about uh, Michelangelo and how he does a sculpture, right? He starts with a block of stone. And in that block of stone, he chips away everything that is not part of the image that he sees embedded in the stone. So if you think about that block of stone representing the sin, the person inside representing man in the image of God, he's encased in sin, so you can't even see God's image. This is why I was talking about Sin breaks the image of God. So the sculptor goes through and starts chipping away everything that's not part of that person on the inside. Those are trials of sin. But then once he gets that person free, if you can imagine I've been encased in stone and you've chipped it away, I've got a lot of pieces of stone still stuck to me in rough spots. So now you're going to take a sandpaper and you're going to smooth it down. That's the test of faith. Smoothing off all the little rough edges to make the image of Christ perfect in you. And the, they feel similar, 
the process is all the same. It's all going through by faith. And what's interesting is the trials of sin is to get you to stop sinning. But the test of faith is to see if you will not sin. Okay? It's almost a temptation to want to sin. And it's not that God tempts you to sin. It's that God purposely places you in situations to see if you will keep your eyes on him or if you will sin by putting your eyes on the natural circumstance and refuse to believe what he's told you. We see this very simply in the Exodus. God has shown, shown himself that he is the God of all gods. Ten powerful plagues against Egypt. Egypt expels the Israelites. And then he destroys the rest of the Egyptian army going through the Red Sea. And God has been providing for them all along. And he takes them on a pathway that they go three days without any water. And they start to get anxious and scared because the Israelites are looking in their natural eyes at the barrenness of where they are. And they see no hope. They are now at the point of, of uh, death because they have no water for three days. And it says, you know, we're about to, uh, to die of thirst. Do you not care for us, Moses? And what about this God of yours? You know, and they're all upset. But it's the first time they turn to God. God was testing them to see, do they actually believe that he would take care of them? Because there was a rock right there, and it says that that rock was Christ. Back in, in the New Testament, it says that the rock that followed them was Christ. He was there all along. God said to Moses, take your staff and hit the rock. He did. Water gushed out enough to take care of all six million people, plus or minus, and all of their herds for a long, long time. Plenty of water. But the, dip, the key was, it was a test of faith. Did they believe God or did they sin by doubting God? And a lot of times we go through our own tests of faith. They can, and the tests of faith can operate at the same time, simultaneously of trials of sin. But assuming we're living primarily righteous lives, assuming that we repent, Assuming that we really pursue the Lord and we try to honor him and be righteous, then most of the trials that we go through are likely these things called that I call test of faith. And I want to talk through just a little bit. What do they look like? How do they operate? And how do you complete it? Um, they look like natural cause and effect almost all the time. I remember years back, it wasn't that many years ago, probably six years ago, my son was in Uganda. Maybe it was four years ago. I forget which he's been in Uganda twice. One of his friends, and my business had taken a downturn, and I was really concerned. I was trying to figure out what's going on. And he had my son has a friend over there in Kenya, and he said, I've got a word from the Lord. He said, tell your dad that the Lord says he's the one that's turned your business down. Jack knew nothing about my business. But the Lord said that he turned it down. I didn't understand it. And then, moving on, we still have all of these patterns of things of just, I'll call it, um, I don't want to call it economic destruction. There is a pattern of that, but, and, but it really manifested that everything I try to do would fail in, in growing the business. I, I share this in the book, The Prayer of Freedom, on a, in a two-year period, I tried to hire one new sales rep. I ended up hiring 30 sales reps in two years because every single time, without exception, every time I'd hire a new sales rep, within two weeks of starting to two weeks of having started, a personal issue happened in that guy's life, and he quit. So I'd have to go interview more people, hire another person, Within two weeks of starting or two weeks of having started, he quit because of a personal issue 30 times in a row. Okay, this is a pattern, right? So there turned out to be some um, 
some blood lineage type of stuff going on. You'll see that in the book. But the main thing it was is the Lord was starting to test me. That was the beginning of a series of tests. And the tests were, for the most part, do you trust me? And they come in different forms. And then we did a, a teaching. I did a teaching a while back. You'll see it under the miscellaneous items uh, on my website. But it was called Demands of Faith. How we can make a demand by faith of our spiritual blessings that are in the heavenly places to be received right now. It's part of the blood covenant. All that is Christ is ours. And the first step in doing that, as the Lord started to guide me with it, was a trip that I took with Mary Ann. And we didn't have the money. And the Lord said, go. I said, will you cover it? He said, yes. I'm taking you through this test. And it was the beginning of a series of tests that continues on today. And what's interesting with this test is they're challenging because you don't see the outcome. You know what you're supposed to do. The Lord is either nudging your heart, opening up passages of scripture to you and passages highlighting you. You're going, Lord, is this it? Are you telling this is what I need to be doing? And you get the strong sense, yes. Or you ask the Lord and you hear the actual words, depending on how you hear the Lord. And the Lord started to keep showing me that he's got me on a test. And the test for me is, do I believe that he will take care of me as he promised without me looking into the natural to see my security? So my security has always been how big is my bank account? How much cash is the company bringing in? I mean, that's, you know, that's a nice way to have security, right? See the bank account up. You see a lot of cash coming through that is uh, far in excess of all your expenses, then you go, I'm safe. So when you take all that out, and the Lord says, just lean on me. Okay, are you sure? Well, that's what I said to do. So are you going to do it? Or are you going to doubt and hesitate? Are you going to cut back expenses because you don't see the money? Every time over the last 25 years in business, Every time our, our business would drop, we would cut back expenses. And then as expenses would rise, somehow the business income would rise. And I started to see this pattern. There was never a time that our expenses were higher than our revenues. Every single time our revenues, our profits were greater than our expenses, which allowed us to stay afloat. And I went back, I was listening to one of my teachings on this. And it was really interesting because I remember this, this time we were going six months. Uh, we're struggling. Everyone's on reduced pay, uh, barely making ends meet. We're going backwards because we're pulling money from our savings account. And I was worn out. I knew God could change the business, but he wasn't. And it was January, late January. And I was just kind of spending all day with the Lord and, and not wrestling with him, but just having one of these, I'll use this term, come to Jesus type of meetings, right? Talking to Jesus. So, And I said, Lord, when are you going to let up? And he said, well, do you really believe that I will take care of you? I said, yes. Well, if you really believe that I would take care of you, how would you be acting differently than you're acting right now? And I said, well, I put my pay at full pay, and I put all my people's pay at full pay. He said, then why don't you do it and trust me? So by an act of faith, I stepped out on what God said he would do. And instantly, our profits had a $20,000 a month swing. It was dramatic. And it happened just like that. And I can't tell where it came from. I mean, normally in a profit and loss statement, you can see, oh, this line item, you're making more or these line items, you're spending less. There was none of that. It was just like, it just, I mean, I still have the PL today and I still can't figure it out. But that's what a test of faith is. Do you really trust me? Part of the test of faith, one of our Bible studies, we had some uh, wonderful neighbors move in and uh, they're part of our test of faith. But anyway, uh, they, uh, one of the times they, um, we had a lot of folks over here. It was a Bible study night. And she texted the neighbor and said, 
we're going to, you know, there's a car in front of our yard, in front of our house, we're going to call the tow truck and have them pick it up. So, you know, that just kind of disrupts things and you, you get your ire up. And I wanted to show it to her, right? And the Lord said, no, no, no. <laughs> Love her. Forgive it, right? And it was the hardest thing to give up because my flesh wanted to respond and react. And the heart says, respond in love. Totally different. And that's a test of faith. Because are we going to do what we know we should do? Or are we going to do what we want to do? And that's what I mean. The test of faith is to see if we will not sin. We see another test of faith in the Bible, a number of them, but one is Peter walking on the water. That's a test of faith. If you go back and read the account, the whole thing is a setup. The entire thing was a setup entirely to test their faith. That's all it was. Jesus sends them out to go back across the lake about four o'clock in the afternoon after feeding 5,000 men plus women and children with five loaves and seven and two pieces of fish. So that's the scenario. He tells the disciples, go back. He goes up to the mountain to pray. He comes back down about 12 hours later. It's about four o'clock in the morning. They've been rowing the entire time and they've only made it about three miles. These are 12 strong men. And they couldn't make it but about three miles, maybe four at most. And what happened is a strong wind kept blowing against them so much that it says that Peter looked at the wind. He can't see the wind. What he was seeing is all the spray. It was in that environment that Jesus tested them. He comes walking on the water. They all get afraid. He says, it's just me. And then Peter, the famous words, Lord, if that's you, command me to come out on the water with you. Right? Oh, you know, he wants to be big. So Jesus says, come. That's a test. So Peter steps out of the boat. He is cockily, cocky may be the wrong word, but I'll use it, cockily confident in the promise of God. And he keeps his eye on God's word. Jesus is the word, right? He keeps his eyes on God's word. And as long as he does, he walks on the water. But then he takes his eyes off of God's word and puts them on the natural. And he sinned. Because he turned away from God and believed what his eyes told him was true rather than what God's word told him was true. And as soon as he did, he sunk. And how we know this is a test, a number of things give us the clue. But as soon as he sinks, you know, Jesus picks him up and Jesus rebukes him. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? Which tells us that it was his choice to doubt. He chose to disregard God's word. He chose to do, he, he refused to do what he was told to do. And instead, he did what his eyes told him to do. I was yeah. just thinking about that. He bound himself to obedience by faith not bound himself to faith toward obedience, but he bound himself to obedience by faith. That is true. He bound himself to, to obedience, obedience by, faith. by faith. And then I was thinking about this flow of one of the trials of sin that's loosing. It's binding and loosing is really what it is. That's a really keen observation. You know? Yeah. And so he looses the sin and then he binds himself to obedience by his faith. Yeah. That's, that's insightful. Let me, um, uh, so here's something else that's interesting. Peter chose to sin. In a test of faith, we choose to sin because we choose to do what our flesh tells us to do. Or... We choose not to sin by doing what God's word tells us to do. If God gives us, a, gives us a promise and we get afraid because we don't see it manifesting, so we stop and we start to act in the natural, that's sin. Because what we've just done is we've said, Lord, I don't believe you. 
it's my perspective like the soul is where all that happens because the soul starts reasoning and rationalizing by looking at the wind and the yeah. waves and it gives your flesh a it gives your flesh permission right to stand right and so what happens is uh speaking about the soul the mind is in the soul and paul says in Romans 8, that the mind set on the flesh, what you see in the natural is sin and death. The mind set on the spirit is life and peace. The other thing that's interesting, as soon as Peter gets back, as soon as they both get back in the boat, says when Jesus got back in the boat, or got in the boat, the storm calmed. He never declared the storm to calm. As soon as the test was over, all of the environment that made the test the most difficult stopped because this storm, keep in mind, it was blowing so hard that they could only row in 12 hours about three miles. That means you probably had three or four foot standing waves, spray everywhere. That boat was rocking all over the place. This gale force almost type of wind to, to set up the test environment for a test of faith. When we go through our own test of faith, what will happen is all hell breaks loose kind of you know, terminology in what happens in our lives to see if we'll still stand firm. See, it's a lot easier to walk on the water if it's perfectly calm. And all you have to do is just look at Jesus and just ignore everything else. Now, that's hard. I, I don't know anyone that's walked on the water other than Peter, right, and Jesus. But even though that would have been easy and still hard, everything was exacerbated even more. And it stopped. And then you read the account. Uh, there's two accounts, I think, of this. And one of those accounts says, and they were amazed for they still did not understand about the loaves. So all these things were coming down into testing them. We find the same thing happening in our lives. As we go through tests of faith, Nothing seems to work in that path that we're trying to go down because the Lord is purposely taking every bit of security away from us. We see this in the Exodus. First, it was a lack of water. Then it was something else. Then it was something else. It's always depravity of something because he takes everything that is your security away and says, trust in my word alone. What I said I will do, I will do, but trust me alone. You will not see it, but trust me alone. We see this start to, that you, there's this crescendo effect when you're going through a test of faith. Let me see if I can visually describe it. So you can either describe it as a, you start with a small point. Uh, for those that are listening, think of a triangle with the point to the left. And you come in, you enter the triangle from the point on the left. And this is the degree of difficulty that you're going through. When you first start that trial, that test of faith, the degree of difficulty is very small. It's easy to get into. But the farther down the test you go, the level of difficulty in completing that test gets more and more difficult. We see this with um, Abraham. God gave Abraham a promise. The promise was, you are the father of many nations. That's not you will be, you are. It's a promise. It's in the now. It's the difference between a heavenly truth and an earthly reality, but in the heavenly realm, it was already a truth. And he said, through Isaac shall your promise be fulfilled. And then when Isaac was 12 or 13-ish, we think, God appears to Abraham. He says, Abraham, I want you to go sacrifice Isaac to me on Mount Moriah. So what did Abraham do? He said, early the next morning, he loaded up, the wood, the fire, took Isaac and a couple of servants, load them on the donkey, and off they went. See, getting started, the intensity was very little. 
yeah, it's kind of challenging, but I can do this. You start getting. But as he starts going through the wilderness day after day toward Mount Moriah, he sees the mountain getting closer and closer in the distance. And he realizes the time of the sacrifice is getting closer and closer. It's getting more intense. Then he leaves the servants aside and takes Isaac by himself with the wood and the fire. They climb up the hill and it's getting more intense. Has Abraham passed his test of faith yet? No. Because the test is not complete. When I was going through my first test of faith that I knew was a test of faith, I was asking the Lord, how long is this test of faith going to be? He said, it's not measured in chronological time. It's measured by faith. When you have completed it by faith, that's when it's over. And so Abraham had not yet completed. He's, they've climbed up the top of the mountain. Then they start laying the altar and the wood on the altar. But the test of faith isn't complete. Then he binds his son and puts his son on the altar. And it's getting more and more difficult. It wasn't until he had the knife in his hand and he raised it up and he was about to slam it down into the chest of his son that Adam stopped the test. I mean, uh, God stopped the test. Abraham, Abraham, yes, sir. Withhold your hand. And that's when there was a ram caught in a thicket. And think about this. Everything God does, there's always a, it appears naturally. And we say, well, that wasn't God. That just happened. Same thing with that ram. That wasn't God. That just happened. I mean, it was just a ram that happened to be there. Abraham, who lives with herds of animals all the time and is aware of all that's going on in the surrounding, he just missed it, right? No. It miraculously appeared, but it was caught because it looks like it was a natural issue. And now Abraham passed the test. The test did not get passed simply because Abraham obeyed immediately. It didn't get passed. He didn't pass the test simply because he kept going down the path towards the ultimate apex of that test. It was only passed at the moment. He was about to complete the sacrifice, showing that nothing was deterring him from making it there. I was giving this example several times. The way to understand a test and what the Lord is expecting is imagine that you are in a room and there's a still door that goes, into, goes to the outside. The door opens out into the outside. And God says, I want you to run as fast and as hard as you can straight outside. The door's shut. But as soon as you get to the door, I'll open it. So now what are you going to do? Are you going to go test the door first? Or are you going to start kind of walking at a fast walk and hold your hand out? <laughs> are you going to run? And the closer you get to that door and it's not moving, are you then going to start to stagger and falter? and hesitate and start to slow down? Or are you going to put your hands out just in case? See, any of those is you're doubting. You're not passing the test. Because God said, I will open the door before you get there. And the question is, do you trust him to do that? And if you trust him, there will be only one thing that you will do. You will run as fast and as hard as you can as if the door was already opened. And you would not slow down the entire time. And only when you run at that pace will God open the door. Because he'll only open it by faith. But if you start to stagger and falter, he will let you slam, slam right in that door because you started to doubt. That's what happened with Peter. Peter doubted and he sunk. And when we go through a test of faith, that's what it looks like. It looks like there's absolutely no way I can survive. How in the world can God do this? 
So we've got this little test of faith going on. I won't describe exactly, but there's a big nut that has to be handled in a short period of time. And I'm going, <laughs> I had this conversation with him yesterday. I said, um, Lord, uh, you're really going to do that? And he said, you think I can? These are paraphrases of the conversation. He said, you think I can? I said, I know you can. Then why don't you just trust me and stop questioning it, right? Because I can't see it in my mind's eye. I, you know, I'm working out where does it come from? How does he do this? And all the things in the natural. And you can't do that. You can't do that because God doesn't operate that way. He causes the natural to happen. He doesn't use the natural to cause his promises to happen. Think about one of the um, times that he tested the Israelites. They wanted meat. He said, great. They were bickering at God. And God told Moses, I'll give them meat to eat. I'll give them so much meat to eat. They'll have meat every day for an entire month and they'll be sick and tired of it. You remember Moses coming? Where? There, it would take, you know, thousands and thousands and, you know, whatever of cattle every day to feed this crowd. How are you going to get that much meat? Say, so, do you doubt me? And so what happened is quail blew in by an east wind. I think it was an east wind and kept blowing in. But think about it. Came in over the ocean. Quail don't live over the ocean. As it was blowing in, it looked like a natural cause and effect. But what's happening is they're miraculously, supernaturally appearing all the time and blowing in. But by the time it got to them, it looked like it was just a natural thing, wind blowing them in from somewhere. But they are materializing out of nothing. And this is what happens with God. He will materialize out of nothing if he needs to to fulfill the promise that he's giving you. But you only pass the test by faith. If you stagger and falter, which is what doubt, the definition of doubt is to stagger and falter. If you stagger and falter, then he's not going to honor what he promised because he only promised it by faith. And if you don't have faith, you know, what James 1 says, uh, uh, if a man does not have faith, let him not expect to receive anything from the Lord. What he's really saying is you have to, um, you know, see true faith believes you receive when you ask. So that yes. has to be, if you're really in faith, you believe the door is already open. Right. You know, you know it's believe. It's believe you receive when you ask. Yeah. Pray believing you've received and then it shall be granted you. And that, that that's the whole thing. So when you assess that you're in a, and this is the cool part about it. And this has helped me a lot. We all go through these tests. And yet we usually don't recognize them because we don't understand how God works. But once we understand, if we look at our life, we say our life is righteous, right? No, we're living a righteous life and we're going through tough times. Ask the Lord, Lord, is this a test of faith or a trial of sin? And if nothing comes up that it's a trial of sin, then, uh, so it's a test of faith. Lord, probably confirm it. Once you know it's a test, then the second thing is, what are you testing me in? What is the outcome you're looking for me to do? And whatever that outcome is, now you know the scenario. As I've been going through my test, I was asking the Lord, <clears throat> seems like it's getting tougher. He said, yep. And it's going to continue to get even tougher. The farther you go in the test, the tougher it's going to be because that's what the test is. It starts easy. And the farther you go down, just like with Abraham, and closer and closer to the point of the final test, it's not the final, the final event of the big test, it's going to get harder and harder to do. Because I'm testing to see what you really believe. Do you really believe me? Do you trust me? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So do you believe God when he says, I'll take care of you. I'll pay the bills. I'll cause this impossible thing to occur. Do you really believe or do you doubt and stagger? If you really believe, 
how would you act differently than you're acting right now? That's ultimately the main message of a test, the main diagnostic tool that you can ask yourself, okay, I'm in a test. If I know I'm in a test, then here's what I know I can expect. It's going to get even harder because everything my eyes tell me is true is going to be an absolute lie according to God's word because God's word is ultimate truth. Therefore, anything that contradicts God's word is a lie. And my eyes tell me it can't happen. God tells me he'll take care of it. Who do I believe? If I believe my eyes, then I doubt God. And I will get what my eyes told me was true. I will get the consequence of the natural. But if I walk by faith, believing God's word, ignoring what my eyes tell me, my eyes tell me the door is shut, doesn't matter, because my God told me he's going to open it before I get there. Before I get there, maybe one centimeter before I get there. But before means before. It doesn't mean 10 feet before, necessarily. So do I really believe that he's going to open it before I get there? And if I do, how fast do I keep running? Do I build up speed faster and faster and faster the closer I get? Or do I slow down the speed just in case? Do I believe by faith? to pass the test, or do I doubt and risk failing the test? Because if you fail the test, two things happen. You get the consequence, and then he's going to test you again. You're going to get a test again, and again, and again, and again, until you pass it. Because he is smoothing off the rough edges, bringing you into conformity to the image of Christ, renewing your mind in Christ to think like Christ. How did Christ think? Whatever you want, Lord, 100%, I'm all in. I doubt nothing of what you tell me to do. And that's the image that he's moving us into. But he does that through these tests of faith. So anyway, that's... Um, I want to share, yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, I think the speed with which I go after the door maybe has to do with the number of times I've done that and he's opened the door for me. Yep. The more you do it, the more you know he's going to do what he said he would. That, that's a great observation for those who can't hear because this does go out on a podcast. No, no, no. Uh, Laura Louise is, um, she must have been yelling at somebody too much. <laughs> but what she was saying is the more you go through these little tests and you see God constantly honoring his word, then you'll run faster at the door the next time because you've got the experience. I can trust God. And that's the whole idea, right? We start on little tests and we keep getting our, you know, bumped into the door and getting bruises. And then we start running and we find, oh, the door opens. So then I run faster the next time and the door keeps opening. And I run faster the next time. because now, And that's why this test right now, it's more severe and the consequences are much greater than anything I've experienced. But it's a lot easier because I know what he's going to do. I don't know how he's going to do it. But I know that I know enough to know it's a test expected to get worse. Expect my eyes to tell me no. You can't do that, and therefore, I need to just trust God and close my eyes and not worry about it. It's a little bit easier, but it's still tough. Yeah. So can you run full speed at the door with your eyes shut? I don't know. <laughs> yes. Only God will know. Yes. That's the goal. He said you have to do it with your eyes closed or open. Yeah. I think if he doesn't specify, it's a fair game. <laughs> Uh, let me also share a couple other thoughts on this. Part of a test is the whole idea of righteousness, obedience, quick, immediate obedience. And in part of that obedience is you're put into a situation, you're on this, you know, this decision tree. Here I come and now I've got these two decisions. Decision A or decision B, which do I do? And one of them takes trusting the Lord entirely. 
let's say that's A. And the other one, you only have to trust the Lord a little bit, but everything in the natural says that's probably the right decision. So the question then is, what do you do? In that test, it's all about obedience. It may not be this big test of faith that you're in, but there's always going to be these little tangential things. And that's where you say, stop, hold on. Lord, what do you want me to do? What's one of the things that's happened with me in recent months, uh, or longer, I forget when I started this process, but I started a structured prayer about the time I figured out, oh, prayer of freedom is structured and that works. And part of the structured prayer is, Lord, I commit to ask you for every single decision I make. Make sure I'm doing it according to your will. And when you pray it multiple times a day, what happens is you start to remember, oh, let me ask the Lord. So when you get to this decision tree, you're at this point and your natural inclination is take option B. Stop and say, well, hold on. Let me ask the Lord. Lord, I've got these two options. What do you want me to do? What should I do? And he says, maybe option A. I remember we had a situation, just it's, it's a fairly decent, large financial bill. I didn't want to pay it. I want to fight a little bit more. I thought it was overly high for what services were rendered. And we didn't have any money in the account to pay it. I was asking, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, pay it. Really? Pay it. Why? It's part of your test. You trust me. Okay. Write a check and pay it. You know, it's, it's one of those things. My inclination was to take option B. But I stopped and asked the Lord, what do you want me to do? He told me to take option A. Every single decision we run into of any consequence, even those things we don't think is much consequence, stop and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? When I was asking uh, the Lord, how do I walk in greater sonship? He said, you do what I do. Or you do what I did, Jesus was saying. I said, well, what do you do? And he opened up the passage uh, as I was reading, and it stood out. He said, I only do what my father tells me to do. <laughs> I said, okay, gotcha. So I just need to ask you every step. What do you want me to do? He said, that's it. Ask me and then obey. And sometimes what he tells us to do doesn't make sense because a lot of times when we do that, it re see, all of our security in our life may be over here. Security. I can't, uh, when I talk, I can't spell. So all of our security life is over here. And he tells me to come over here. Why? Because he wants to eliminate all of our security. So the only security we have is our faith in him. That's where he wants us. That's actually where he puts the Israelites. Gave them their food one day at a time. And it's still, we're about to, on our, as we move into the next sessions, um, starting up next week, we'll be talking on this. But the idea is, he tells us as well, Father, give us this day our daily, prevent, our daily bread. He expects us to trust him for all of our provision one day at a time which means our only security is in him, not what we can see. And so when you go through the tests of faith, know that all your security is going to be completely wiped out. So you will have nothing that you can rely on except him. And that's part of the test. Are you willing to trust him as you go through that? Has this been helpful? Has this been interesting? Thought-provoking? Any questions for... I thought we'd be doing some Q&A, but I got long winded. Does that mean you can't be a prepper? Uh, you can prepare. That, that's a good question. Can you prepare? I, I think that's really the question. Has he told you to prepare? Uh, the, um, there's some things that wisdom would say you want to prepare these things on. So I go to the Lord and said, don't worry about it yet. You can prepare later if you want to but not, don't worry about it now. Okay. So, I mean, so I'm a prepper, but he said, no. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. It's, we don't make decisions based on man's wisdom. What we think is right. Stop and ask for every decision. Lord, what do you want me to do? I, I would, um, add on to that. 
So uh, about a year and a half ago, um, had, a, had a lake house with extra space and things were going sideways with the distribution trucks and the shelves were going bare. And um, I did not necessarily pray and ask God, but I bought all of this stuff because I had the I had extra space to put it at the lake. And I thought my youngest child and I, or the, however many children that can get there that want to be there, I can feed us for a year on this. And I put all the stuff uh, in the garage at the lake. And um, a year later, the food <laughs> started to expire. Oh. And then I had mice that moved from the basement level of the house up to the next level of the house and the third level all the way up till I had like a mouse palace the lake <laughs> that I thought I could, I mean, I started setting traps, you know, by myself. And then I had to drive to the lake three days later and find the dead mice and deal with the dead mice. So I went through a season between that and then uh, I could not keep up with it. Can so I share? A, maybe I should have prayed and asked God. I might have been premature. Yeah. So, so here's what's interesting because this also brings up a good thing. A lot of times when we act in the natural and what we think is the right thing to do, but we haven't asked the Lord, then technically that's sin. Because he didn't want us to do it. Had you asked the Lord, he may have directed you different. So if he would have directed you different, then that means that what you did is not correct. It was sin. You didn't know it was sin, but that's okay. You didn't, it doesn't matter whether you know it or not. But there's discipline that comes in and the consequence. And so it's not just, you know, it's no big deal. It's now there are other issues that the Lord allows and saying, okay, learn, right? Yeah, James. Is that supposed to people that really don't ask God on a daily basis? They just say, well, I know God will take care of me. They don't ask him. They just have this, maybe it's a faith, but they still say it. They know God will take care of them, so they're not going to do any prepping, any planning. Right. There are a lot of people. I think that's not exactly what you're saying. Right. Some people presume upon God, and presumption is dangerous so uh ask the lord and the, and what happens is the more you do it the more you start to hear his voice clearer because you if you keep talking to him you'll hear him more frequently and you'll start to recognize his voice sometimes it's a nudge in your heart then over the time it becomes deeper and then over the time you start to understand what he's directing you on and then it becomes a conversation just last couple of days i started doing something asking lord just start dying out loud because i know okay yeah, I get it, Lord. You know, we're just having this conversation and it's like um, just really kind of funny stuff. But as you move into this direction, he will direct you. It says in Psalms that he guides every step we take. The question is, are we listening? And if we're listening, are we obeying? You can only be led by the spirit if you're obeying the spirit's leading. Otherwise, you're being led by the flesh. So any, uh, we're about out of time. Any other questions or comments or anything from our online folks? Yeah, James. I'll just make one more comment. Thinking that age we're living in, we're going to all be tested to a limit. And so it's better to start practicing up here. <laughs> That's right. We're all going to be tested for sure. But I see you're coming on screen there. Do you have a question? No, I was just going to, uh, you you answered it before I asked, as I say, well, what if we ask and we don't get an answer? <laughs> you will always get an answer. The question is if you're discerning it. Right. And a lot of times the discernment, I've done this in times past when uh, my clarity of hearing the Lord wasn't as, as crisp as it is now. Um, if it was a big decision, I would delay if it's a big decision, I would take extensive time off and extended time off and fast to make sure I would hear. Um, if it's a smaller question, I realize that, you know, the Lord says that he puts his thoughts into our thoughts and he guides us that way. As our pastor said one time, it was, I thought it was just very um, observant comment. If you are pursuing the Lord, he is guiding you. So trust that the direction you're going, generally speaking, 
is the direction he wants you to go. And one of the things I've done over the years is recognizing that. And so recognizing that if I'm asking him questions and I don't really know the right thing to do, I, I don't hear a clear answer from him, but I really think that this option is what I should be doing, then I'll sometimes just do it because I know that he's guiding my thoughts. And generally speaking, all my thoughts are lining up in the direction he's leading me. So if you're living righteously, if you're pursuing him and you're asking questions, you're not quite sure. If you need to make a decision, make the decision that you feel he's guiding you into, even though it may not be a clear um, discernment of that. Okay. All right. I think we're about out. Any other questions? Okay. You all have a blessed day. Go get theprayerofreedom.com. Yeah. It is tremendous. Be blessed. Well, I hope you enjoyed that lesson. And if you're like most people, it's probably a little deep for you because I teach at a very deep level. But you know what? God's Word is deep and powerful. And the more you really understand it, the more you can walk in faith and live in a way that very few people actually do. So I'd like to encourage you to go back and listen to this again or watch it again, because it's like lasagna. Uh, you know, when you make lasagna and you eat it the first day, the flavors are fine. But if you let it sit for a day, all the flavors start to meld together and then they just really burst in flavor and it tastes fantastic. And that's what actually happens with this type of teaching. When you go back through a second time, you already kind of know what to be expecting because it's you've already seen it the first time. You go back through and now it starts to make a lot more sense. And the most important part are the little nuances, the little things I teach that you may have missed the first time that are the connecting dots to really understand this. They start to come alive. So please go back through, you'll learn a lot more, I promise you. Also, I'd like to extend an invitation as long as, I'm not sure when you're watching this, but currently I open up my Bible study teaching to Zoom uh, participants, okay? And if you'd like to come and join on a live session, be able to ask me questions or just actually watch it live, then you can find that channel and find the times at my uh, Radical Faith website called GetRadicalFaith.com. That's where I take all my Radical Faith teaching and just put it in one website, GetRadicalFaith.com. And up at the top, you'll see a link that says Bible Study. If you click that link, if I'm still opening this up to the public, then you'll find the schedule and you'll find the Zoom link. And I would love to have you join us. Thanks again for watching. Again, be sure to go back and watch it a second time. It's going to make a lot more sense. Have a very blessed day and be very, very blessed.